No one would have believed in the early years of the 21st century that this world was being watched as keenly and closely by intelligences greater than human and yet as mortal as their own. That, as people busied themselves about their various concerns, they were scrutinized and studied like creatures that swarm and multiply in a drop of water. With infinite complacency, people went to and fro over this globe about their little affairs, serene in their assurance of their empire over matter. Yet, across the gulf of space, minds that are to our minds as ours are to those of the beasts that perish. Intellects vast and cool and unsympathetic regarded this earth with envious eyes and slowly and surely drew their plans against us. Mars, our planetary neighbor, a favorite of science fiction authors. It's carried many different meanings throughout history, but before all other roles we attach to it, Mars was just a bright red dot in the night sky. However, if we were to ask human imagination, the dot cannot stay a dot for long, and the redness of it simply calls for interpretation. Ancient cultures have interpreted it through apocalyptic motifs, blood and fire. The Babylonians have attached Mars to Nergal, a god of fire, war, and destruction. The Greeks, most likely inspired by the Babylonians, saw it as the star of Ares, their god of war. This defamatory campaign was continued by the Romans adopting Greek culture. The star of Ares finally became the star of Mars, the Roman god of war. After the fall of the Western Roman Empire, medieval Europeans kept using the Roman names of the planets. But for the next thousand years, as the bloody motifs moved from the sky to the earthly reality, the dots became just dots again. With the invention of the telescope in the 17th century, we once again discovered the night sky. And with a closer look, the scary red dot seemed to become friendlier. As telescopes became more powerful, the picture of the world across us became more complete. We began measuring its period of rotation and distance. We monitored the phenomena of clouds and storms. We explored the composition of its atmosphere. We discovered two little moons, and we observed closely how Martians all over the planet built irrigation canals. Wait, what? We observed closely how the Martians... Oh, okay. It really did happen. But there were no canals. And certainly no Martians. The story goes like this. In 1877, astronomer Giovanni Schiaparelli made the first detailed map of Mars. There, he outlined seas, continents, and a series of channels. Schiaparelli saw these channels as natural occurrences, and he named them after the Earth's rivers. However, if we were to ask the human imagination, that world cannot stay uninhabited for long. And these channels simply call for interpretation. The imagination was actually ignited by an inconvenient linguistic conundrum. The Italian word canali implies both natural and artificial canals. On the other hand, in English, channels implies natural canals, while canals implies artificial ones. Schiaparelli's canali are thus translated into English as canals. That is how the hunt for Martians began. And let us introduce the man who thought he had caught them. Businessman, author, mathematician, astronomer, and the greatest connoisseur of Martian infrastructure projects, Percival Lowell. 
At the turn of the 20th century, Lowell spent 15 years extensively observing Mars, seduced by the idea of artificial canals. During that period, he published three books that described the advanced Martians who were desperately trying to postpone their extinction by irrigating the planet. Lowell's ideas became popular among the general public. After all, the 19th century was a time of colossal building projects, and surely the Martians engaged with them too. On the other hand, the scientists were skeptical. Light and dark areas were actually visible on the planet. But apart from those who really wanted to see them, Lowell's canals were nowhere to be seen. Lowell let his imagination run wild. He saw exactly what he wanted to see. The science fiction of that age also reflected this fascination with Mars. The author, Herbert George Wells, recalled the planet's ancient apocalyptic atmosphere with The War of the Worlds. In that novel, which also served as a critique of British imperialism and colonialism, extraterrestrials from Mars occupied England, thus shattering the illusion of human domination over the world. In the decades that followed, at least in literature, Mars was fertile ground for great battles, adventures, and even romances. That image changed irreversibly after our first close encounter with the Red Planet. In 1964, the spacecraft Mariner 4 gave us the first close-up view of Mars. At the distance of about 10,000 kilometers, we could see an intriguing world, but without any trace of the builders. We didn't find Martian builders even after the first landing. On the surface, we have found only a cold, rusty desert and an eerie howl of the wind. These new insights were reflected in contemporary science fiction as well. Thus, the neighboring planet became an uninhabited expanse, ready for conquest. The Mars Trilogy, written by Kim Stanley Robinson, was maybe the best in depicting our new perspective. In the trilogy, the colonization and transfiguration of the planet is followed, and intertwined through the story is a complex social analysis of such an enterprise. Wells colonized became the colonizers of space. Still endlessly self-involved, now convinced in their domination over the two worlds. However, at the end of the 20th century, few would have believed that we would discover a giant sculpture of a humanoid face on Mars. Ugh, not again. One of the satellite images showed an object resembling the shape of a human face. However, if you were to ask the human imagination, something of a passing resemblance to a, to a face, oh, you get it by now. Some were not yet ready to say goodbye to the idea of enterprising aliens. Canal builders were replaced by space stonemasons. But what was it, if not a face? Scientists, not that keen on speculation, had let the general public have their fun. The fun lasted for 25 years, until a photograph came along from a new satellite equipped with a more advanced camera. It turned out again that we saw exactly what we wanted to see. In this case, it was a play of light and shadow over the hill. And so we were alone yet again. Our inability to view celestial bodies more accurately has brought us many more stories from our ancient mythology. These stories have been giving us invaluable insight into the lives and thoughts of our ancestors. A better view, still undefined because of the limitations of early telescopes, has ignited the imagination. We saw a planet, but the most exciting stories found their source in the unseen, in the gaps of our understanding. We crave fantastic stories today as we did before. And just like before, we will have to leave our stories to the pages of history when science and technology light the way to new insights. Now, little by little, we are discovering the true face of Mars through space missions. 
we are exploring its hypnotic polar regions, uncovering the traces of liquid water on its surface and seeing many beds and estuaries of ancient rivers only from up close. We are witnessing sunrises and sunsets on another world, all the while observing our own home wandering in a foreign sky. This will be the story material for generations to come.